This is a strange lens, Panasonic's new 10 to 25 mm f1.7. When I first heard about it, I thought it sounded like a viable alternative to the Sigma 18 to 35 plus speed booster combination that many Panasonic users have been using for years. But the more I tested, the more I realized that it wasn't that simple, and in many ways, proved inferior. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody, I'm Gerald Undone, and if it's not fixed, don't break it. So I've been putting these two lenses head to head for the past few days now, and I wanna share my results with you, but in order to keep things flowing and logical, I'm gonna be consulting my results so that I don't miss anything, and then at the end of this video, I'll give you the who should buy which lens segment. So let's start with the basic specs. Now, neither of these lenses is small, but the Panasonic is a little bit lighter at 723 grams, where the Sigma with the speed booster when I weighed it is 985 grams. And for all the sizes and price that we're gonna talk about here, it's for both the speed booster and the Sigma combined, because that's the only real way to get a fair comparison against this lens. Now when the barrel is fully extended, the Panasonic comes in just a little bit shorter than the Sigma. I would say just about a quarter of an inch or a centimeter shorter, but it is thicker. It has, it's more girthy. This one is a 77 millimeter filter thread and this one's a 72 millimeter filter thread. Now both of these lens combinations are past the point of being what I would consider small or compact. So to me, the small differences don't really make a difference. They're both, you know, big heavy lenses. But to put it in simple terms, the Sigma with the Metabones is about two pounds and this one is about a pound and a half. And you do notice that the Sigma is a little bit denser, but when it's on the camera and you use it, to me, there's not a huge discernible difference between the two. Price wise, this Panasonic lens is going to cost you about $1,800 US and this one, the combo, is about $1,300. It's about $650 for the lens and $650 for the speed booster. And that lens is on sale right now. It's like $639. Normally I think it's about $800 US, but there's been crazy deals going on in this. Like right now I think it's $639 and you get a filter and some, th some other accessory with it. So it's a great time to buy these and it makes it even better of a value proposition, but we'll get more into that in a minute. Now when it comes to other physical characteristics of the lens, the Panasonic has a D-clicked aperture ring, which means that you can move smoothly through the iris or you can set it to A and then you can make those adjustments using one of the dials on your camera. It also has a manual focus clutch which you can cock down like that and then you can move through the focus range and see the witness marks here to know you know where exactly you're focusing. It doesn't have hard stops however which I usually like to see on a focus clutch so you do f hear it and feel it a little bit but then it keeps turning after that without changing the focus which is actually identical to how the Sigma lenses tend to work natively without any adjustments. It has a little dial here in which you can see your focus indication and then it has sort of a soft stop and then the ring keeps turning after that. So both perform the same when the focus clutch is enabled on the Panasonic. The zoom ring on both is about equal size and I would say has about equal dampening between the two. The Sigma might be a little bit nicer to adjust through the zoom ranges where the Panasonic is, it's pretty much the same though, but the Panasonic does have that extending barrel that goes in and out. I think it gets rested between 12 and 14 mils, but then when you go all the way open to 10, it extrudes a little bit and up to about 25, it starts to come out as well. So that might pose an issue for you if balancing on a gimbal is something that you're concerned with where the Sigma 18 to 35, everything is internal and there's no extending barrel. Neither one of these lenses is stabilized, but the Panasonic does offer a little bit better weather sealing than the Sigma 18 to 35. Now let's talk a bit about the focal lengths because there's a bit of math going on here because this one has a Metabones on it. So this is a 10 to 25 millimeter, and I did all my tests on the GH5, which has a two times crop. That's probably the standard for most micro four thirds systems. So this one becomes a 20 to 50 millimeter equivalent compared to the full frame field of view that you would expect to get. Now this one on the other hand is an 18 to 35, but it also has a point 0.71 times focal reducer on it, which once you put that focal reducer and then add the two times crop, it becomes a 25.6 millimeter to a 49.7. So on the long end, they're pretty similar. They're almost both exactly 50 millimeters. But on the wide end, this one goes to 20 and this one goes to about 25 or 26. But when it comes to moving through that focal range, something you should know about the 10 to 25 is that it's not quite par focal. At least my copy is. I don't know if they're different for each lens. So it's, it's pretty good, but I find that if you focus at 10 millimeter and then moved all the way to 25 millimeter, it's not quite as sharp as if you were to refocus it at 25 millimeter. And the same is actually true for the 18 to 35. However, as I've mentioned in a previous video, if you have the speed booster on, which obviously we do in this comparison, you can make an adjustment to the back focus on the speed booster. So now with that minor adjustment I made on my Metabones, my Sigma 18 to 35 is par focal. If I focus on something 18 millimeters and then I zoom to 35, it is tack sharp all the way through the zoom range. And that's something we're not gonna be able to do on the Panasonic because we can't really make any adjustments to it because we don't have an adapter attached. 
Now, I did a bunch of focus tests, and like I said, I did them with the GH5. Oh, by the way, since I know some of you are probably asking, well, if he's holding these lenses, which lenses is he shooting on? I went back to the Sigma 16mm contemporary lens that I used to use on the GH5. Right now, I've got it on the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. It's f1.4, so I'm getting, you know, about a 2.8 uh, full-frame depth of field equivalent. And it's a great lens. I like it. But uh, I've been using the Sigma 18-35 to on the Blackmagic Pocket for the last several videos. But anyway, so we're throwing back to that lens while I test these two. So when it comes to autofocus performance, though, uh, there's some weird results that I wasn't expecting. So first, let's talk about video continuous autofocus, because my first thoughts was that this lens is probably, you know, a video focus lens. Now, I will tell you that I was shocked at how bad the autofocus is for video continuous on the Panasonic lens. It just wouldn't focus. And I have the GH5 with the latest firmware, version 2.5, which is like the updates for this lens. And I use the same focus settings for both lenses and the ones that I've come to use and made videos on for the GH5 before that have worked really well for me. And it just, it would just take forever. I was holding an object up in front of the lens and it just like sometimes wouldn't even start focus until I like, you know, shook it around or brought it down and back up. And then I also did a test where I would push in and out of an object to see if it would focus. And again, I had that same issue. Anytime moving the lens back or forward, it just, it was really, really slow, really, really terrible autofocus. But strangely, when I put on the 18 to 35 with the Metabones, it didn't have those problems of not being responsive. It was pretty responsive and actually worked quite well. There is an issue over here with this combo, which is kind of well known, and that the Sigma glass is heavy, and the way that the Sigma autofocuses, because they're more photographic lenses, it just kind of tosses the glass. So you do get this kind of like quick to the back, quick to the front, which I wouldn't exactly call smooth or nice looking if you're trying to keep the focus transition in the video. So I wouldn't probably use autofocus on either of these for video, but if you had to, the Sigma drastically outperformed the Panasonic for continuous autofocus in video. But for photos, it was the complete opposite. I wouldn't trust the Sigma at all for continuous autofocus for photos. So say you were doing like burst shooting and you wanted to track a subject, this did not work at all and the Panasonic worked very reliably. Here, let me show you in Lightroom what a run of photos looks like on these two different lenses. Okay, so this first set of photos here is taken on the 18-35 to with the Metabones and all I did was hold down autofocus continuous and I brought the camera closer and farther away while holding down the shutter. And as you can see, <laughs> Almost none of the shots are in focus. When I got close and stopped moving, it was fine, but pulling in and out was not reliable at all. And these were all shot at f2.8, and that's the same for both lenses. And you can see just absolutely terrible performance on the 18 to 35. And now, if we jump ahead, this is where the 10 to 25 section starts, and you can see that you get much better results. Like, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's quite usable and quite good, and the majority of the shots are in focus, pulling in and out. So the Panasonic absolutely destroyed the Sigma for photo, but the Sigma completely destroyed the Panasonic for video continuous autofocus. Now for single AF in photo, it doesn't really matter. Like say you're just lining up a shot for a landscape, you could manual focus, you could autofocus. So it doesn't really matter for autofocus single, just for tracking, this lens is much better if you're doing tracking photo bursts and continuous autofocus. Now let's talk about image quality, which it's pretty similar between the two, but there are a couple small advantages to the Panasonic. So I have a couple images here. This first group is wide open and I also have them both at 2.8. And what I've noticed is that, let's zoom right in here. So I targeted the focus here. This is a 4K recording. That's why it's not ultra sharp as in a photo. Uh, but if we, I targeted the focus right here at the center and this is the 10 to 25 and this is the 18 to 35. 10 to 25, 18 to 35. So if we just look back and forth, I would say the sharpness seems pretty similar. But there is one thing that I do notice and that's that the Sigma has worse fringing and you know, like chromatic aberration. If we look up here in this corner here, this is the Sigma and this is the Panasonic, so that purple fringing is more subdued. But the Sigma might actually be a hair sharper. That's the Sigma again. It might be just a little bit sharper than the Panasonic in the corners. In the center though, the Panasonic might be a little bit sharper than the Sigma. That's the Sigma, that's the Panasonic. Now if we look at the 2.8 images, where we can see a difference though, is in that fringing I was talking about. So this is the Panasonic, and then this is the Sigma. So we can definitely see that the Sigma is sharper over on the sides. Like if we look at the numbers here and then put the Panasonic on, this definitely gets softer. But the purple fringing is much better controlled. You can see these purple bars on the Sigma quite clearly, as well as the green on the other side. And if we jump over here, you see how we have these kind of yellowish fringes on the top and these very thin purple fringes? But if we switch over to the Sigma, well now you can see a clear purple fringe all the way around and then a greeny yellow fringe all the way around here, including on the Rubik's Cube. So back 
and forth. But again, we see the difference where the Rubik's Cube is sharper on the Sigma, even though it has fringing, and then kind of softer on the Panasonic with no fringing. Now, another way that the Panasonic does beat out the Sigma 18 to 35 in terms of image quality, or at least in optical design, is its resistance to flaring. So I just took a flashlight and sort of flashed them on both of these lenses to see what the flaring was like. And the 10 to 25 from Panasonic did remarkably well to not have much effect when it comes to contrast reduction across the frame or have any kind of weird, you know, flare lines and stuff like that. It was pretty isolated where you would only get a reduction in contrast right at the spot where you were shining the flashlight. Where the Sigma 18 to 35, on the other hand, definitely had sort of a wider flare problem with, you know, contrast reduction all the way across the frame. And it also had some of those funky, you know, flare patterns that can appear where they were pretty much non-existent on the Panasonic. So whatever the coatings or however they designed the lens for the 10 to 25, it's done extremely well for managing chromatic aberration and flare and much better than the 18 to 35. But keep in mind, it's only when you do this comparison that you can even see it. When I compared the 18 to 35 to some of the worse Rokinon lenses like the 24 millimeter, I found that it looked significantly better than the Rokinon where it was sort of night and day that the Sigma was way better for chromatic aberration and flaring and all that. But then when we compare it to the Panasonic, well now the Sigma 1835 looks like trash for fringing. That's not the case. The Sigma 1835 is actually quite good when it comes to fringing and flare reduction. But the Panasonic 10 to 25 is excellent. It might be one of the best lenses I've seen on this system for controlling those issues. I also measured the color accuracy here to see if there was a shift from one lens to the other, and I found both of them to be quite neutral. So neither one seems to really affect the color accuracy, and both provide a nice neutrally accurate image without much of a lens bias. Now some people might say that this means the lenses don't have any character, but other people might find that advantageous if they want just sort of a neutral image and then they apply the character in post. But they are both pretty sterile, pretty clean when it comes to the colors. Also at 2.8, the transmissions are very similar. If we look at just sort of the overall exposure here, and I pop one off and one on, they're very, very, very similar. Where there is a difference though is in their maximum apertures. So this is a 1.8 lens, but when we put the speed booster on it, we get about a 1.3, which then when we put it on a two times crop micro four thirds sensor, we're getting a depth of field similar to about an F 2.6 on full frame. Now this one's a 1.7, so we're gonna get about an F 3.4 on full frame. So it's about two thirds of a stop of light difference between them, but it does have an impact on depth of field if that's what you're looking for. Say that you want, you know, bigger bokeh balls and a shallower depth the field, this one isn't going to provide that as well as the Sigma 18 the Speed Booster will, which is kind of interesting because a lot of the marketing and hype that I've seen on social media is about this lens allowing you to bring that full frame depth of field to your micro four thirds, and it doesn't. And I wanna show you that right now. So I've got three clips here in Resolve, and this one, the first one, is the 10 to 25, and all three of these are wide open. If you examine the bokeh balls in the background there, and we'll shift them from the edge to the center so you can see them go from that cat eye pattern more to the rounded pattern. And you know, they have that ringing in the center there. It's not exactly smooth, but they also have a significant sort of fringe around the outside, but also just gauge how large they are. And if you look at the bus here, look at the depth of field that you're getting from the front wheel, which is where I focused to the back wheel. Now let's jump over to the 18 to 35 and we'll do the same thing. So they both start with that sort of warped edge. And then when we bring them closer to the center, they smooth out and become more circular. But you notice that the 18 to 35 doesn't have that deep yellow fringe around the outside of its out of focus circles. And if you look at the wheels here, again, I focus on the front wheel. Now look how out of focus the rear wheel is. That should give you an idea of how much shallower you're gonna get with the 18 to 35 plus speed booster combo. But in both cases, neither one of these is offering sort of a true, you know, 1.4 full frame, which I will show you now using the Sigma 35 millimeter art lens on a full frame camera at f1.4. This is what it looks like. So you can see that the out of focus areas are much smoother in this case with a much more pleasing result, none of that outside ring or anything like that. And if you look at the out of focus difference between the front wheel and the rear wheel, it's significant. So obviously this is drastically more shallow. Now I'm just gonna flip through. This is the 10 to 25. This is the full frame 35 at 1.4. So this is more like 1.4 versus 3.4, and that's with both of them wide open. And then the Sigma 18 to 35 is somewhere in the middle there with about a 2.6 equivalent. So full frame, Sigma 18 to 35, 10 to 25 f1.7. And all of these were shot at 35 millimeter equivalent focal lengths. And as you can see, the Panasonic lens is just not going to give you that full frame depth of field that you're probably looking for based on the limitations of the focal length. In order for this to provide that same framing 
on a micro four thirds sensor, the lens has to be a 10 to 25, which is way too wide to get as shallow as the depth of field. Oh, and while I have you in here, I will show you once again the difference in that two thirds of a stop of exposure difference. So if I turn off the matching grade that I put on, this is the 10 to 25, that's how bright that is at 1.7, and this is the 18 to 35 at 1.3. So if we just sort of flip back and forth here, that's about what two thirds of a stop looks like. So now that we know all that, what conclusions can we draw? Well, both setups are great and in many ways, very similar. If you're manually focusing for video, there's very little difference between them. The Panasonic offers better fringing and flare reduction and has a declicked aperture ring, which is nice, but the Sigma has two thirds of a stop extra light and also provides a shallower depth of field and has smoother out of focus areas. And the Panasonic is $500 more and more restrictive in the sense that you can only mount it on a micro four thirds camera. Where the Sigma combo, you can mount the Sigma lens on a bunch of different systems or adapt it in different ways. And the Metabones adapter can be useful for putting other lenses on your micro four thirds camera, making this far and away the better value proposition. If you need autofocus for video, neither is a great option, but the Sigma definitely outperformed the Panasonic, which surprised me. For photos where fast tracking isn't important, then either solution is great and the same points from earlier carry over. But if you need continuous tracking in photos, well then the Panasonic is the only option and it absolutely destroys the Sigma in that regard. But it's at this point that I find this lens hard to categorize because I don't really see the point in spending $1,800 on a lens if a shallow depth of field and fast action photography is your goal. It seems like that money would be better spent on a larger sensor with a competent phase detection autofocus system. I just don't get it. It's not stabilized and it's too big for vlogging or travel. And if you're using it for photos, well you don't really need that declicked aperture or the manual focus clutch. And even though it does focus quite well for continuous autofocus for photos, I don't know a lot of action or wildlife photographers that would find this focus focal range particularly useful. So it's gotta be intended for video, right? But in that case, the Sigma 18 to 35 with the speed booster combo is definitely the better buy. The only exception I could see is if somebody is already invested in micro four thirds, plans on staying with that system for a while, shoots both photo and video, and needs a flexible option in this specific focal range. And I imagine there are quite a few people that fit that description, but for me, it just seems a little bit too niche to warrant the excitement that this lens generated. I almost feel like this lens was made just to prove that it could be with this focal length and this aperture size, instead of thinking about if it should be. I'd love to hear from you guys though, where do you fit in the categories I just described and does this lens satisfy those needs of that category? Are you the perfect customer for this lens? And if so, what are you gonna use it for? Let me know in the comments below. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done.